This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Season 3. This was the big one. The season that redefined what Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends was going forward. Season 3 is probably the most nostalgic season for me personally, as it was the one being marketed when I was a really little kid. All promotional material and VHS tapes at the time were of Season 3. This was a big season, Thomas' big comeback to British TVs after a few year hiatus, and the first brand new season for the show's new international audiences. Quite a large task for the showrunners. So just how did they do it? And how does the season hold up? Let's dive in. Get ready for a big chunk of information here, because a lot happened in the years between Seasons 2 and 3. After Season 2 in 1986, Thomas went on a bit of a hiatus for a few years. Each of the series' two leaders, creator and executive producer Britt Alcroft and director David Mitten, went off to fulfill other goals that they had in mind. David Mitten, along with Robert Cardona, had aspirations for a new show with no involvement from Brit. A little show that would be called Tugs. Tugs came out in 1988 and was very similar to Thomas in the way it was focused on anthropomorphic vehicles with faces. However, the two shows couldn't have been more different. Tugs was, of course, focused on talking tugboats, and by the nature of it, was filmed with real working water sets. I have a whole video on the history of Tugs if you want more information on this series. The main thing to take away from Tugs here is the amount of advancements and developments they made from a filmmaking perspective. The props were incredibly detailed, more so than anything on Thomas. They challenged themselves filming with these highly detailed working boat models in actual water and using various weather conditions like fog and high wind and snow. They played a lot with times of day, changing out the sky backdrops and altering the lighting to make it look like sunset, or dawn, or calm nighttime. And not to mention the plethora of crash and explosion sequences that required well-timed pyrotechnics. All of this was a significant step forward for the model crew and their capabilities. Tugs did not take off though, and the amount of money Mitten and Cardona poured into it eventually led to Clearwater Features declaring bankruptcy, shutting their doors in 1990. Britt Alcroft, meanwhile, had started looking into marketing Thomas to other countries. In 1989, Thomas made its way to the United States via a variety show called Shining Time Station. The show was a half hour long, featuring live action segments with actors. A little magical man called Mr. Conductor, played by Ringo Starr, lived in the station, and would tell the children stories about an engine called Thomas, and all his friends on the island of Sodor. Then I'll tell you a story about my friend Thomas. Ah, here we go! This would then transition to Thomas episodes, playing in between the live-action segments. Shining Time Station was a big success, even winning a Daytime Emmy Award in 1989. America loved Thomas. Thomas also made its way to Japan a year later in 1990, where it was also a huge home run success. With two new huge markets to fulfill now, there was more demand than ever for an all new season of episodes. And so, season three was greenlit. With Clearwater features now gone, Thomas would be produced under the name of Britt Allcroft's own company the Brit Allcroft Company. She rehired David Mitten as director and basically the whole crew returned. Fuji Television in Japan helped fund the production of the new season, and in return, footage for a special called Thomas and the UK Trip was produced exclusively for them. The special featured all new footage shot on the season 3 sets that was released nowhere else. It was never aired outside of Japan and has strangely never been given a proper DVD release over there. 
as far as I know anyway. Just like Season 2, Season 3 posed a challenge. There was a severe lack of Thomas-centric stories left to adapt from the original books. They opted to change things up a bit, having the season be half episodes based on railway series stories, and half all new original stories, most of which were based on magazine stories written during the hiatus period. These stories were written by Andrew Brenner, who funnily enough would go on to be the show's head writer years later. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This new assortment of stories gave the showrunners more creative freedom, and allowed them to film more stories with Thomas and the already existing characters. Wilbert Audrey himself was famously very upset by this change. And in the third series, they thought that they could write my stories for, for them. The producers, somewhat big-headed. He believed that Britt and co. had thought they could write his work better than him, forcing Thomas into stories that he wasn't in originally, and writing stories that broke real railway practice. In famously the episode, Henry's Forest, where Henry stops on the main line without alerting a signalman. They've showed a lamentable ignorance of Rule 55. What responsible driver would stop as if he was in a roadside lay-by? Needless to say, this was the season that turned Wilbert Audrey sour on the show. The filming of season 3 was quite bizarre. Unlike every other season where they filmed every shot needed on each set for all 26 episodes, this season's production was cut into two parts. The first 16 episodes were filmed as one batch, and the last 10 were filmed as a second batch, fans of which dubbed seasons 3A and 3B, respectively. You might notice how Knapford is the big station in the 16 episodes of 3A, and then strangely in the 10 3B episodes, they use Tidmouth, and Knapford doesn't appear. You might also notice that the interior of Tidmouth Sheds changes drastically between 3A and 3B. I'm not really sure why it was done this way. I think that big promotional prop display at Hamley's in London had something to do with it, and 3B was filmed after, but I don't know if that's true or not. Who knows? And lastly, one of the biggest changes of all was the voice talent. Ringo Starr did not return for season 3, which means a new narrator had to be found. Michael Angelus took up the mantle of the UK narrator, and became the show's longest narrator ever, holding the role all the way to the 16th season. I want a scarf, I want a scarf. Rubbish, Percy. Engines don't wear scarves. Engines with proper funnels do. You've only got a small one. In America, meanwhile, George Carlin, yes, THE George Carlin, BLOW IT OUT YOUR ASS, became the voice of Thomas. Carlin took the role because he wanted to show a different side of himself to the world, a side that wasn't profane and overtly philosophical like in his stand-up. Carlin spoke very fondly of his work on Thomas. He loved that the show didn't talk down to kids or blatantly state the morals of their stories. The morals of these stories were never jammed down the kid's throat. They weren't blatant. They weren't um, in capital letters. They were gently massaged into the framework of the show. He thought it was a very smart show that treated its young audience with a level of intelligence and was happy to be a part of it. Carlin stuck around for season four as well and went back and re-narrated seasons one and two for the American audience, replacing Ringo Starr's dubs. Hello, Gordon. Is it tomorrow? asked James. Gordon didn't answer. He just let off steam feebly. Did you lose your way, Gordon? said James. Hello, Gordon. Is it tomorrow? Gordon didn't answer. He just let off steam feebly. Did you lose your way, Gordon? These are the dubs that I, personally, am more familiar with. George Carlin was the voice of my childhood. Perhaps it was instinct! Season 3 had a rocky release first coming out solely on VHS in England in 1991. That same year, it premiered on American TV via Shining Time Station, and then finally airing on British TV in 1992. Season 2 was slightly darker and more gritty than what we had had previously. Season 3 was the show's big comeback year, and in a way, was a sort of return to form, trying to recapture that magic from the first season that everyone so fondly remembered. 
A return to the fantastical storybook-like visuals with focus on details in the foreground, and less of that guerrilla-style grit that Season 2 specialized in. The sets all look so much better than they ever have before, all now with working water and varied sky backdrops and lighting and weather. All the advancements the crew made from working on Tugs definitely influenced what they did with Thomas this year and beyond. This is the first of the golden years of Thomas in my opinion. The show never looked so good. While there was an attempt here to recapture that storybook magic of the first season, there simultaneously was also a move into different territory. Real world territory. Many real life elements start to come into play in episodes this year. Real life events such as British Railways scrapping its steam engines are mentioned and set the stage for an episode. Real life engines such as City of Truro and Flying Scotsman make appearances. Thomas continues its transition from an all storybook world to the real world. The classic seasons continue their trend of heavily focusing each season on a new part of the island of Sodor, building out the world. Season 2 was the Edwards Branch Line year, while Season 3 takes things to the coastline and explores that whole west side of the island. Harbors and docks and boats and beaches galore in Season 3, as Duck's Branch Line, aka the Little Western, gets heavy focus. Part of me thinks they focused this season so heavily by the sea is because it was right off of Tugs. They knew how to handle water now, and had so many props from that show at their disposal to reuse. It was like they still had that itch to keep doing seaside stuff because they never got another chance. Which hey, I'm not complaining about. These coastline sets are some of the best sets of the whole series. In the last video, I described Season 3 as an adventurous season, and I still stand by that. The stories all feel so much bigger this time around, putting these characters through trials where they really have to prove themselves, like braving a flood, tightrope in a collapsing bridge, a landslide that destroys the workings, a storm that devastates the island, a bee swarm breakout in the big station that causes mass panic, rescuing a village that gets snowed in after a massive blizzard, or saving a fellow engine from certain doom. The characters feel like real heroes this year, more than they ever have before. But the season does not just feel big as in it harboring big events. Season 3 feels big in terms of tone and themes, furthering those questions that Season 2 posed. What is the next step in this dieselization plot? In the episode Tender Engines, Diesel tells Gordon that steam engines haven't much time left. But I'm afraid that no amount of tenders will save you in the end. We Diesels are taking over. Then we start to see the direct effects of that in the episode right after, Escape, where we witness an engine in line for scrapping. But what you're doing? Escaping. From what? Scrap. But not even just that. We also get episodes like All at Sea, where Duck ponders the world beyond the horizon. What is he meant to do here that he can't do out there? What is a sentient steam engine's purpose? I wish I could sail to faraway lands. Engines can't go sailing, snorted Percy, because engines can't float. Duck still had his dreams. Season 3 really was the start of this go big or go home attitude that the rest of the Golden Seasons relished in greatly emphasized by the huge advancements in the cinematography and that new orchestral score. The score of Season 3 onwards is worthy of praise. Prior to this, Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell stuck to a synth score, very of the time in the 80s. This season onwards, they changed their instruments and started producing more orchestral sounding themes, like music you'd hear in movies. <laughs> was a change that technically first happened in Tugs, and it carried over to this season. <music> the 
yet another piece of Tugs' production that helped improve Thomas' future aesthetic. Tugs and Season 3 go hand in hand with each other in my opinion. I see so much of both in each of them. But at the same time, Season 3 has its share of smaller, slice-of-life stories too. Like a garden party at an orchard, Percy wanting to wear a scarf, Gordon gets muddy, or Donald befriending a duckling. Unlike the previous two seasons, Season 3 is very loose in its structure. There is no real overarching plot or major connecting through lines. All the stories are mostly episodic, meaning you can watch a lot of these out of order and there wouldn't be many continuity issues, which is something you couldn't do with Seasons 1 and 2. However, I think this loose structure and the varying tones of the stories makes Season 3 a rather enticing viewing experience. I envy people that watch this season for the first time, because you never know what's going to happen next. Will the next episode be some small slice of life story where Thomas helps Bertie? Or will it be some dire crazy event where the engines have to scramble and rescue everyone as a landslide devastates the area? Season 3 is truly a roller coaster ride. Season 3 is unique in the way that all the characters have something to do this year. Season 2 sidesteps from characters and gave focus to ones that were sort of glossed over in Season 1. As a result, characters like Henry or Toby didn't really do all that much. That's not the case this year. Everyone has a role to play. When it comes to who did the most stuff this year, Percy again wins the number one spot, with a grand total of seven lead roles. Duck, shockingly, comes in in second with six, remember when he was a main character? And Thomas and James tie for third with five each. The season is unique in the sense that it took the characters as written by Audrey and built off of them. This is the year we started seeing new sides to these faces and what makes them tick. New personality traits and interests that would go on to define them in later years. You look as bright and cheerful as my red paint. Of course I can't talk about every character, so I'll just go over some more of the standout ones. Thomas got a bit of a change up this year. Season 3 showed a newer, nicer side to Thomas. The Brit Allcroft version of Thomas, if you will. Which somewhat contrasts his dicky personality in the two seasons before, where he thought of no one else but himself. If we hurried across the viaduct, it might collapse. And then you'd have no passengers at all. What would you do then? Run my train on time for one thing, but what about my passengers, asked Thomas. Don't worry, they'll be looked after. I personally see this slight change as character growth. We're moving slowly away from the younger, selfish Thomas to a slightly older Thomas, who puts his wants aside to help bigger causes. Multiple times this season, Thomas and Percy work together to help a bigger cause, such as saving the mail train or rescuing a Snowden mountain village. He's still the same old Thomas, though, mopey or grumpy about whatever minor inconvenience he has. I won't be able to say Happy Thanksgiving to all my friends. Don't worry, said Percy kindly. I'll do it for you. It's not the same, side Thomas. <laughs> but there's definitely some change occurring. Thomas is growing, becoming more of a wholesome character. Thomas's friendship with Bertie was explored quite a bit this year, featuring two episodes focused on them. It also very much further explored his friendship with Percy, who kinda has become the show's breakout character. Percy has gotten more leads than Thomas two seasons in a row at this point. He's kind of hijacked the show. What season 3 did for Percy was make him the show's little hero. Most every Percy story is some big adventure he has, which contrasts to him being the smallest of the fleet. A big punch in a small package, if you will. And this continues to be a trend in seasons moving forward. Henry got a lot of love this year. He only had two starring roles, which isn't much, but his main episode, Henry's Forest, did quite a lot for him. In this episode, we saw a new side to Henry, a side that loves nature and slowing down a bit. Henry always felt better for being here. He couldn't really explain why, but his driver understood. It's peaceful, he said to Henry. It made him more than just one of the grumpy big engines, and totally separates him from Gordon. Henry is not just a green Gordon, he's far more layered and appreciative of the world around him. 
and it's this side of Henry that later seasons would go on to tap into more. Donald and Douglas had a pretty good year. Season 3 is interestingly the only year that the twins are split up and treated as their own individual characters, each starring in their own episode totally separate from the other. Donald got Donald's Duck, in which Douglas only appears in the background, and Douglas got Escape, in which Donald does not appear whatsoever. Thinking about it, I don't think Donald and Douglas actually shared dialogue with each other once the entire season. That's kind of weird. We learn that Donald is kind of a joker. He doesn't pull punches, and is very blunt. I'm Great Western, and I- Quack, quack, quack! What? Ye heard? Quack, quack, ye go! Sounds like ye're an egg laid! Now wheesht, and let an engine sleep! But cars can be troublesome, and- Say no more, Duck! It's a pity, but the wee engine will just have to learn for himself. Douglas, meanwhile, has his own little arc. After learning of what Edward did to save Trevor back in Season 2, he returns the favor and saves Oliver from Scrap. Douglas is the more heroic of the twins. I really love that this season didn't treat them both as one, like later seasons do. It totally saw each of them as their own individual characters. Speaking of twins, Bill and Ben had a great year as well, getting two episodes that they star in. I didn't talk much about them in the season 2 video because there wasn't much to say. They're twins, they're mischievous. That's about it. We got a lot more this time around, seeing them in different lights. Literally, in a different light too, as each of their starring roles utilized them in brand new locations we've never seen them in before. We got an episode where they fall out with each other, and another where they act quickly and rescue workmen from a catastrophic rock slide. The only character that didn't pop up this year in any regard was Daisy, who was very strangely absent. The story goes that Rick Sigelkow, the producer of Shining Time Station, had issues with Daisy. He didn't like the fact the only prominent female engine character had all this excess makeup on her and thought she was somewhat sexist. So her episodes never aired on Shining Time Station and she was sort of swept under the rug in favor of Mavis, who was introduced this season and starred in her own two-parter. Mavis, I think, is a great new character. She's a wonderful foil to Toby. This young, feisty, thinks she knows everything Diesel, contrast to this old geezer steam engine who has seen it all. Combined with Toby's notorious sense of humor, and you got some good comedy gold here. Having trouble, Mavis? Chortled Toby. I am surprised. Grush! Freight cars, he grumbled, should be where you want them, when you want them. Said Mavis and flounced away. He says I've no business jauntering down Toby's line. Toby's a f Oliver was also introduced this year, in the famous episode, Escape. Oliver probably has the coolest debut story of any character in the show. He's introduced in the sorriest looking state ever, running away from certain doom. And only with a helping hand from a friend indeed, does he reach his safe haven. I appreciate that even though we are meant to look up to Oliver as this magnificent character that braves such an escape, he is also totally and completely flawed. He lets his prestige get to his head and totally embarrasses himself, bringing him down to the same level as all the other characters. No one is perfect, even the ones that seem the most invincible. They are all equal. Truly wonderful lessons this show teaches. Other new characters include Toad, Oliver's brake van, who strangely has no dialogue, and Bulgy, a one-off shady double-decker bus that gets his just dues. I believe the MVP award of Season 3 rightfully goes to... Duck. If Season 2 was the year of Edward, then Season 3 is the year of Duck. Duck is in the most different place at the end of the season than where he started. Starting as just the station pilot as normal, and ending as the main runner of his own branch line in a completely new part of Sodor, alongside Oliver. Duck really came into his own this season as we see all new aspects of his character unfold. We knew from last season that Duck is very proud of his heritage, and is a tough stands-no-nonsense type. And episodes this year, like All at Sea, start to break down that barrier, and we see what makes Duck tick. Duck loves the ocean, and is endlessly fascinated of what lies beyond the horizon line. Do you go to the horizon, asked Duck? Yes, and beyond. Duck sighed. As a steam engine, he's stuck to his rails and has no idea what's out there. It's only appropriate that in this same season, 
Duck is promoted to run his own branch line, which, appropriately, runs along the coast. I really wish All at Sea and Donald's Duck swapped places, so they would have established Duck's love for the sea earlier in the season, and thus making him getting his branch line all the more rewarding. By the end of Season 3, Duck truly is one of the main characters, with a lot more going on below the surface than meets the eye. I think my episode choices for this season are probably going to be the most predictable ones yet. This year's standout episode rightfully goes to, you all know what it is, Escape. There is no denying this episode is one of the greats of the whole series. It has some incredibly striking visuals, heavily focused on dark shadows and contrasty lights, reinforced by a soundtrack inspired by Indiana Jones and The Great Escape. I actually think Escape is one of those episodes where the adaptation plays out a little better than the original story. The original story is tied to Douglas being a stowaway to Sodor, something that was established in a previous book. So he returns the favor, and helps stow away another engine there. I want away here with Donald, but I'd have been feared to do it on my own. Well that information wasn't exactly translated to the show, so instead now Douglas learns about what Edward did for Trevor, and decides that one good turn deserves another. This little scene with Edward is a nice setup to the action plot, and adds some continuity between the seasons. I've described Escape before as a gateway episode. The plot of this story is tied to real-life events, a time period in England where British railways scrapped all their steam engines in favor of diesels. Oliver, one of these steam engines, tries to escape from his doom. Kids intrigued by this story will want to look further into why Oliver ran away, and thus indulge themselves in some real-life history. Escape is truly one of the greats of the series, and is totally deserving of being in a top 10 ever placement. I highly recommend everyone to check this one out. I also think All at Sea is worthy of being the runner-up for its grand message. The message that it's important to accept who you are, and understanding what your strengths are, despite your limits. It doesn't matter what's out there, because home is where your friends are. My pick for worst episode of the season goes to one good turn. I don't think it's a bad episode. I like that it builds Bill and Ben's characters a bit, but it's just the circumstance of how the story happens is so silly. The two fall out because one got in the way of the other going onto the turntable. It's so insignificant. I feel like the story would have made more sense if they had caused each other to derail and block the yard or something. It's a nice episode though, with a nice ending, but it's the one episode of this year's batch that I do kind of roll my eyes at. I kind of wish One Good Turn and Heroes swapped their inciting incidents. Like, having Bill and Ben completely embarrass themselves at the harbor and delaying Gordon's train, getting in trouble with the Fat Controller, which causes them to blame each other for it all happening, only to make up in the end when they have to haul a train together. And Heroes has the silly insignificant incident that makes the two look like they're incapable of working as a team because they let silly things come between them only to show they can step up to the occasion when disaster strikes the clay pits. I don't know, just a thought. I think the episode that sums season 3 up in a nutshell is Henry's Forest. This episode has it all. It has all the impressive camera shots and model work and beautiful score and the emotional beats that season 3 is known for. It's also the episode I point to the most often, when I talk about how the TV series unearthed new sides of the characters the books never delved into, something season 3 really pushed. It's also infamously the episode that Audrey criticized the most, which again sort of sums up where the showrunner's minds were at this year. Henry's Forest is a beautiful episode, and I think sums up what season 3 is all about perfectly. The word I would use to describe Season 3 is big. This was Thomas's biggest season yet. Everything about it screams go big or go home. Every character had something to do this year. The stories are more adventurous than ever. The sets are way more impressive. The soundtrack is more orchestral. The morals of some stories are quite grand and pose considerably big questions for its young audience. 
Season 3 was Thomas's big comeback season, and they came back swinging. Season 3 was the grandest step in the show's quality, and it really has Tugs to thank for that. So many sequences and stories that occur this year wouldn't have been possible in the previous seasons. I really doubt a landslide sequence in Season 2 would have looked this impressive. Season 3 walked, so the later, even more impressive seasons could run. This was the start of a golden era. Gone is the toy-like charm of the 80s, and end with the real-world view of the 90s. The island of Sodor feels more real than ever. And despite some of the criticism it's garnered, it's very easy for me to see why so many people claim Season 3 is their favorite season. As my good friend Zio would say, Season 3 aesthetic wins every time. Well, I hope you all enjoyed my review of Season 3. This was my favorite of the retrospective so far. I can definitely feel that excitement in me tingling as we approach the really good seasons. Season 4 is the next one, and man oh man, I cannot wait. This is the part of the video where I would go over all the updates to the channel, but I actually don't have much to go over this time. I do have a TikTok open now where I've been posting my Thomas Debunked videos, which just hit 10k followers. So thank you all for that. Go follow me there if you haven't already. Speaking of Thomas Debunked, we're nearing the end of the first batch of shorts I produced for it. I originally made 15 of them, and 13 are currently uploaded. There may be a short hiatus while I work on the next batch, so just a heads up there. Once again, a big thank you to all my patrons who voted for this season retrospective to be the next video. Next week, I will put up a new poll where you can all vote on the next big video for the channel. So pledge today if you'd like to take part in that. Thank you all so much for watching as always. Your support is always appreciated. See you all in the next one, folks. Bye-bye.